The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting, Inc., ESPN Kansas City, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The following program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros of the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Connor will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci and Connor Kelly in studio. As always, thank you so much for joining us. We have a nice show today. In about 15 minutes, we'll be joined by Jason Bloom, global market strategist at PowerShares, who is currently the fourth largest ETF provider in the country. Uh, right now, PowerShares manages around $130 billion invested across nearly 160 ETFs. And actually, they recently announced they would be acquiring Guggenheim's ETF unit. Guggenheim is the eighth largest ETF provider. That deal is set to close next year, so PowerShares will only be getting bigger. The focus of our conversation with Jason today will be on commodities. And I always find this to be an interesting topic because you can find extremely intelligent investors who believe it's a really good idea to own commodities as part of a well-diversified portfolio. And you can also find very smart investors who have zero interest in owning commodities. They'll tell you commodities are too volatile, that they don't really add much value, that there are significantly better ways to get inflation protection and diversify your portfolio. We're going to go in-depth on this topic with Jason. We'll look at the current commodities landscape and what some of the positive drivers may be in areas like oil and agriculture. We'll certainly find out how Jason views the role of commodities in a portfolio. And then we'll spotlight a couple of PowerShares commodity ETFs. PowerShares does have the single most popular broad-based commodity ETF on the market. So we'll look at that ETF along with another similar version of this strategy Connor, the goal today is simply to shed some light on investing in commodities. <clears throat> you know, just about every investor owns stocks, usually owns some bonds. And then from there, a lot of people have some exposure to, to maybe real estate through some REITs and maybe a couple alternative assets like MLPs, maybe gold. But, you know, for most people, it stops there. And we've discussed on recent shows, Nate, how gold can really bring out the strong emotions in investors on, on both sides of the argument. And the same can absolutely be said for commodities. There are very strong views on if commodities belong in your average investor's portfolio. And, Nate, to be frank, it's something that we struggled with internally at the ETF store. I mean, do we own commodities outside of gold or not for our clients? And, you know, it needs to be said, before the advent of ETFs, the average investor, this wasn't even a discussion or a consideration. I mean, you couldn't imagine owning commodities. I mean, you're not going to go play futures contracts and risk taking delivery of a barrel of oil or some corn, right? But now ETFs do provide the ability for the average investor to, to own all different kinds of commodities if they want to. And to be clear, some of, there are some nuances for sure about how these ETFs do get their commodity exposure. But... Uh, we will touch on that with our with our chat with Jason, I think. But the question we're going to try to address today in the show is, should investors own commodities as part of a well-diversified portfolio? Well, you know, the other issue here, too, is that the performance track record of commodities going back over the past 10 years or so. It's pretty is, rough. Yeah, it's been downright awful, especially if you compare it to stocks and bonds. And so I think that's only enhance this debate of whether or not to own commodities in a portfolio because some investors say see that's why you shouldn't own commodities but then there are other investors who say well now's a great time to buy after commodities have been beaten up for so long so we'll get into all of this with jason bloom again he'll join us here in about 15 minutes later in the show in our weekly market update we will talk some more bitcoin as of yesterday Bitcoin was making a run at $6,000. It's up 
over 20% just since we were on air last week. <laughs> we have a, a few thoughts on some comments last week from J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon regarding Bitcoin. And then we're also going to uh, very briefly briefly touch on BlackRock's earnings reports. We don't do that often, but uh, obviously iShares ETFs continue to propel BlackRock. And we saw an interesting take last week about whether or not uh, this is ultimately a good thing for BlackRock shareholders. So we'll explain that later in the show. As always, if you have questions or comments, you can email us at advice at etfstore.com. You can visit our website at etfstore.com, uh, or you can message us through Twitter. Now, before Jason Bloom joins us, we always like to take just a few minutes each quarter to run through the upcoming guests that will be appearing on the show. We've also posted this out to etfstore.com. Next week, we're extremely excited to welcome Martin Small back onto the program. Martin is the head of of U.S. iShares. Of course, iShares is the largest ETF provider in the world. Uh, now, we're not going to cover BlackRock's earnings with Martin, but we are going to cover a wide range of ETF uh, topics, similar to the conversation we had with Vanguard's Rich Powers back in September. We'll talk record ETF inflows, uh, the fee competition, smart beta ETFs, bond ETFs, a little bit of everything. So we're certainly looking forward to that conversation next week. The following week, on October 31st, Steven Schoenfeld, founder and chief investment officer of Blue Star Indexes, is going to spotlight the Blue Star Israel Technology ETF. Steven joined us on the program earlier last year, and I've got to tell you, if you're not familiar with the Israeli tech scene, this is a conversation you'll want to hear. Believe it or not, Israel is right behind Silicon Valley in terms of technological innovation, and the idea with this Israeli tech ETF is obviously to allow you to capitalize on this. And there's no better person to speak on this topic than Stephen. So, Connor, that should be a really interesting conversation. Well, I, you know, the next two weeks is really an example of what I love about our show, Nate, is we'll have the head of ETFs at the largest ETF provider in the world next week. And then the following week, we're going to talk to a smaller, highly innovative ETF shop. I mean, the difference between these providers could not be more stark, but the common thread here is ETFs. And whether you're one of the largest investment firms in the world, like BlackRock, or a small startup with a neat idea wrapped around you know, is the Israeli tech scene, the takeaway is that both these firms are using ETFs as their vehicle of choice to launch their investment ideas. Now, on November 7th, We'll welcome Meb Faber back onto the program. Meb is founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. He's going to spotlight two ETFs, the Cambria Global Value ETF and the Cambria Tail Risk ETF. And Meb is another person. If you haven't heard Meb before, he's one of the better market resources you'll find. Even if you put ETFs aside, Meb eats, sleeps, and breathes the financial markets, and he'll be able to provide, I think, a really unique perspective on current stock valuations and how you should think about investing in this environment. Then on November 14th, another conversation I'm really looking forward to, Ethan Powell, founder of Impact Shares, is going to explain his innovative new nonprofit ETF platform. And the idea here is that Impact Shares will partner with other nonprofits and socially responsible organizations to help select underlying holdings in a particular ETF that theoretically would help further some social cause. And then the net proceeds from that ETF, so from the fees, would go back to the nonprofit organization. A pretty interesting concept. Well, it is an interesting concept, some that hasn't been done in the ETF space yet. And it really does fit with the general theme of the rising interest behind socially responsible investing or ESG investing. I mean, th th this fund was actually backed, which I found this pretty interesting, Nate, by a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation, so a name that certainly gets your attention. And Ethan Powell is a longtime ETF industry veteran, so I'm really looking forward to that conversation uh, with him in November. The week of Thanksgiving on November 21st, uh, a, a really interesting show that we have lined up. Troy Helming, CEO of Pristine Sun, is going to give us an inside look at the renewable energy space. So Pristine Sun develops solar and wind projects. Of course, this is an area that has also attracted a lot of investor interest when you consider the growing popularity of sustainable or ESG investing. So we'll get to hear firsthand what's occurring on the ground from Troy. And then we'll also be joined that week by Bill Belden, 
head of product development and management at Guggenheim. He's going to spotlight the Guggenheim Solar ETF. So, Connor, in the dark, cold days of late November, we get to talk solar energy uh, to hopefully warm things up a bit. On November 28th, we'll be joined by Jack Tater, co-author of the newly released book, Crypto Assets, the Innovative Investor's Guide to Bitcoin and Beyond. This is currently the number one bestseller in the investment management category on Amazon. And Jack is an angel investor in the cryptocurrency space. So I think given our focus on Bitcoin recently, this should be a timely discussion. And I've got to tell you, I can't wait to read the uh, book. You know, Nate, it, it feels like in the Bitcoin cryptocurrency world, it, it's it's trying to drink from a fire hose at times. But we're going to make a concerted effort to continue educating ourselves on, on Bitcoin and the underlying blockchain technology. And, you know, we hope our listeners come along for the ride with us. You know, this is not going to become the Bitcoin show, but we do think this is a technology that's here to stay. And it could become an investable area down the road for some more aggressive, for more aggressive investors, obviously. So we plan on continuing to stay on top of this developing space. And I think you referenced this um, earlier in the intro, Nate, but later in the program after our interview with Jason, you know, we're going to give some thoughts on uh, what Jamie Dimon's recent comments were on Bitcoin last week. A, a day after saying he's never talking about it again, he went on quite a rant. And uh, we're going to give our opinion on some of the comments that he made here in a bit. And then uh, quickly here, as we get into December, we have, I think, three of the best resources you're going to find in the entire ETF space. First up on December 5th, Dave Mazza, head of ETF investment strategy at Oppenheimer, will join us uh, to explain their revenue-weighted approach to ETFs. And we'll also discuss the smart beta ETF space uh, as a whole, which, of course, continues to grow at a very rapid rate. You may recall we have had Dave on the program several times in the past when he was over at State Street uh, Spiders, but he's now at Oppenheimer, so uh, we certainly look forward to reconnecting with him. On December 12th, Eric Valcuna, senior ETF analyst at Bloomberg, will recap 2017 ETF flows and also discuss some of the key ETF trends he's observed this year. And I would tell you that if you're interested in ETFs and you're not paying attention to the content Eric is putting out on a daily basis, you're doing it entirely wrong. Yes. Uh, Eric is a must follow in the ETF space. And then we'll close out the year with Dave Nodick, CEO of ETF.com. And I always say... You would be hard-pressed to find five other people walking the face of the earth that know more about ETFs than Dave. I would actually like to meet the person who knows more about ETFs than Dave. Uh, I, I just don't believe they exist. But Dave will offer his 2018 ETF predictions. Uh, so, Connor, not a bad lineup to uh, close out the year. You know, there it, you'd be hard-pressed to find two guys that know the space better than Eric Balkunas and Dave Nodig, like you said, Nate. And it's going to be a great end of the year to – not only recap 2017, but look ahead at 2018 with, with both of those as they are truly on top of the e ETF industry as much as anybody in the world. Um, and that's going to be a really great uh, kind of end to our year here on the ETF Store show. Uh, quick reminder, we do love hearing from our listeners. If you have questions, comments, feedback on the show, whether positive or negative, we do want to hear from you. You can email us at advice at etfstore.com. You can send us questions or comments through our website, etfstore.com, or you can ping either Nate and I on Twitter or you know, the official account of the, of the company. Our, all of our interviews are always available at our ETF Expert Corner at our website, as well as full podcasts are available for free on our website, Apple iTunes, Google Play, wherever you happen to podcast, you can find our, our show. And lastly, if you like what we're doing here and you do have a couple of minutes, we would greatly appreciate it if you could give us a quick review, especially at iTunes, because that does help other listeners who are interested in ETFs to find our program. All right, let's take a break. And when we come back, Jason Bloom, global market strategist at PowerShares, will join us on the program. We'll go in-depth on the current commodities landscape. We'll hear how Jason views the role of commodities in a portfolio. And we'll also spotlight a couple of PowerShares commodity ETFs. We'll do that right after the break. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. 
ATF Store Show, Nature AC and Connor Kelly in studio. I'm now very pleased to welcome to the program Jason Bloom, global market strategist at PowerShares. PowerShares is the fourth largest ETF provider in the country. And Jason's background is in commodities. He currently leads PowerShares research and strategy surrounding commodities. And commodities will be the focus of our conversation today. And I should note, PowerShares offers the most popular broad-based commodity ETF on the market, the PowerShares DB Commodity Index Tracking Fund, which we'll spotlight here in a few moments. Jason is joining us via phone from Chicago. Jason, our pleasure to have you on the program today. No, thanks very much for having me. Happy to be here. Jason, I always like to start these conversations with a basic definition of the topic at hand. So let's start today with how you define commodities, which is obviously a very broad term. What's included here? Well, yeah, starting from the broad perspective, really commodities are physical elements or materials that are consumed in the course of sustaining human life or human activity. Right. So uh, as opposed to other investments, which um, have sort of a more ethereal concept like, uh, you know, equity securities or bonds materials, these are things like, you know, crude oil, uh, corn, uh, industrial metals, precious metals. Um, And so uh, they are unique in that sense that they are consumed. And then you've got to go back to the earth in some way or another and find more. Jason, you know, it's interesting. Uh, We have found that this topic of commodities can get a bit contentious among investors. It seems like there are two clear camps, uh, one who won't touch commodities with a 10-foot pole, and then the other who believes commodities are a real value add to a portfolio. And my sense is that the former views commodities as being too volatile, uh, they don't pay interest or dividends, you're simply relying on higher prices. Walk us through how you view the overall role of commodities in a portfolio. Sure. So we really see commodities as serving two and possibly three roles. The first uh, foundational role that commodities serve is as as a diversifier in the portfolios, right? And so what what most people's goals or their financial advisors' goals are in building a portfolio is they want to achieve a certain return over time, but they want the smoothest ride possible. So the way to accomplish that traditionally is to find investments with low correlations. Stocks, tend to have high correlations to each other, moving up and down. Same thing with many aspects of the bond market. Not all, but many. And so commodities tend, in most most time frames, to march to the beat of their own drum based on their own fundamentals. Commodities are very cyclical, and that cycle traditionally does not align with the broader business cycle. So oftentimes when stocks or bonds are struggling, commodities are doing well. And and vice versa, commodities may struggle during times when stocks and bonds are doing well. And so when you blend commodities with that broader investment portfolio um, and you rebalance in a disciplined way over time, commodities can actually lower the volatility of a portfolio. Jason, you mentioned uh, commodities are cyclical. Do you think commodities should be viewed as something investors buy and hold forever? In other words, should they have a permanent place in a portfolio, or should commodities be approached in a more tactical nature? Well, I think there's room for both approaches. You you know what's kind of funny is that uh, the most sophisticated institutional investors tend to be the long-term buy and holders of commodities, and we tend to see retail investors get a, uh, seem to be a little more tempted to try to time the commodity markets because the volatility is high. But the way our institutional clients look at commodities is as a diversification tool and as a hedge against inflation over the long term. And, so, and it's a small part of their portfolio, so they're okay with the volatility because the actual portfolio, larger portfolio volatility, um, is actually aided by commodities over time, but you have to be able to stomach the volatility of that commodity a, a component. And so I think that, that retail investors um, tend to want to try to pick the timing right so that they don't feel the pain in the short term of those drawdowns. I mean, but you, you do have to acknowledge that volatility in commodities is higher than in other asset classes in most time frames. And that that's just uh, the nature of the uh, of the beast, so to speak. Why is it that commodities can be a good inflation hedge? Well, when we look at correlations, when you look at at inflation during periods of high inflation, 
uh, commodities uh, have a very high correlation. So in other words, when inflation can be a fairly pernicious dynamic, and it can lead to higher interest rates, which can cause headwinds for the equity markets. Uh, but typically during those times of high inflation, a big part of that inflation are, are very strong commodity prices. And so you, when inflation is really accelerating, commodities tend to really uh, uh, to, to per, outperform during those time frames. And usually bonds and stocks are not performing well during those time frames. Um, other things like uh, people think of as uh, tips, inflation-protected uh, securities um, are also another way to hedge against inflation. But tips are bonds. And usually interest rates are rising, usually, when inflation is accelerating. And so tips don't actually tend to correlate as well to inflation as commodities. So they are the, the, the highest correlated asset uh, to inflation. What about accessing commodity exposure through uh, companies involved in this space, oil companies, natural gas companies, uh, miners, even emerging market uh, stocks uh, from countries who may be commodity export focused? How does that compare with actually owning commodity futures or otherwise gaining exposure to the underlying prices of commodities? Yep, I get that question quite often. Um, I will say one thing is that if you look at gold miner stocks, you'll see that those stocks are actually more volatile than gold itself. So going going away from com- the physical commodity to the equity does not always lower your volatility. Uh, but I will say that there is a problem. So if, if you have a certain view that favors commodities and you invest directly in the commodity, then you have a very high likelihood of profiting if your view is correct. The problem with equities is that if you're being tactical, the equity price itself and the the stock price itself is actually forecasting the future price of the commodity. And it's depending on when you buy that stock, you could see that commodity rise and the stock may not rise because the stock had already priced that rise in. And so it is just a more complex um, uh, it, is, it is a more complex calculation when you're buying the equity, and there's more uncertainty. So the way I kind of look at it is sort of basic probability. If you've got a 70% chance right of being commodities and uh, about the commodity and a 70% chance of being right about the equity uh, uh, outcome uh, uh, related to that commodity, then you've only got a 49% chance of being right. Um, and so I just – if you have a certain – thesis in the market, you do. T- I tend to favor the most direct exposure. Now, I will say that emerging market equities have traditionally had a very high correlation to commodity prices over time, and that is not – I like emerging markets better than going out and buying gold stocks or buying uh, crude oil drillers, for example, because um, that, that macro correlation over time has been very persistent, and I think you're taking less risk. In, in betting on what the stock price is valuing in for the future price of commodities. Our guest is Jason Bloom, global market strategist at PowerShares. Our topic today is investing in commodities. Jason, let's talk about two ways to access broad-based commodities using PowerShares ETFs. PowerShares does offer the most popular broad-based commodity ETF on the market, the PowerShares DB Commodity Index Tracking Fund, ticker symbol DBC. Can you give us a quick overview of this ETF? Sure. DBC is meant to give you broad exposure to the commodity universe. It is our uh, fund that we tend to favor for clients who are interested in, in adding commodities to their portfolio. It's nicely diversified within the commodity space. So you've got 14 commodities. And I'm going to give you the round numbers. Basically, half, about half the portfolio is energy-related. So you've got crude oil and crude oil derivatives like uh, gasoline and diesel on heating uh, uh, and natural gas as well. And then you've got about a quarter metals and a quarter agriculture. Uh, and so you're kind of getting exposure to each of those underlying sectors. And to be honest, agriculture doesn't correlate that much to metals or energy. And so you actually get what I think is the, the most prudent way to approach the commodity space is, is to not try to over-concentrate your bets, but um, just try to get good exposure to the sector overall. Now, this ETF uh, holds futures contracts, and one of the potential issues with that is uh, something called Contango. And I was hoping maybe you could provide just a quick explanation as to what Contango is and then uh, how the CTF seeks to prevent some of that, some of the issues associated with Contango. 
Sure. So contango simply refers to the the price, the, the shape or slope of the commodity futures curve. So when you buy commodity futures, you're buying a contract to take delivery or make delivery at a certain date in the future, so say March 2018. Well, there are also contracts that, that expire in June of 2018, in December of 2018. If the curve is upward sloping, it means that future prices are higher than near-term prices, and when that near-term contract expires, you're essentially selling it at, the, at that price, and then you have to pay a higher price to roll out to the futures contract, and that creates uh, what we call negative roll yield as you roll to those later dated contracts. Uh, so that is, of course, a headwind for investor returns and is to be avoided if possible. So one of the things that our, uh, our, all of our commodity funds do is we optimize which future contract we're going to roll to. And we look for the contract with the best roll yield uh, up to one year out on the futures curve. So in Tango, uh, if, if the curve is in Contango, you want to find the contract with the smallest negative roll yield. And conversely, if the curve is in backwardation and downward sloping, in other words, you collect some money every time you roll that futures contract, then you want to find the part of the curve where you're collecting the highest amount of roll yield. And we do that for each individual commodity in the portfolio, make that calculation uh, when we're rolling that. So when you look in the portfolio, you will see futures contracts that expire across a, a whole range of months, depending on the shape of the curve for that individual commodity. Now, another ETF I wanted to ask you about is the PowerShares Optimum Yield Diversified Commodity Strategy No K1 ETF. That's a mouthful, ticker symbol PDBC. Uh, now, this looks like a very similar strategy to DBC. It's just structured a bit differently. Uh, can you walk us through the basics of that ETF and perhaps uh, compare and contrast a bit with DBC? Sure, sure. So that really the most important differences are the different structures. So you, you get rid of the K-1, which DBC delivers uh, every year to its investors. Uh, the cost of that then is, is that you get a 1099, but at the end of each calendar year, PDBC has to distribute any um, notional uh, profits uh, that it generated during the year, and that distribution at the end of the year uh, is taxable at ordinary rates. So uh, as it's just sort of a broad rule of thumb, PDBC without, with the no K-1 makes a lot of sense in a retirement account, some account uh, that is tax-deferred uh, or tax-advantaged. And DBC um, delivers a K-1, but it gives you 60% um, long-term, 40% short-term capital gains rates. The, the upshot of that is that if you're in a high tax bracket and this is a taxable account, DBC will give you likely a, a tax advantaged outcome, and so and PDBC uh, now excuse me PDBC then no K one also gives you a lower management fee. So again, most of our clients who are not taxable investors favor PDBC. The, the, the taxable investors tend to favor DBC, but if you don't want the K one, then 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 PDBC will do that for you. Again, our guest today is Jason Bloom, global market strategist at PowerShares. Jason, with the remaining time we have, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the general commodities landscape. And with the exception of last year, it has been a pretty tough run for broad-based commodities overall. Even going back 10 years or so, they produced around 5 to 6% negative annual returns compared to close to over 7% annual returns for U.S. stocks. Given that... What's the opportunity moving forward? What are some potential positive drivers here? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good recap. I, I look at the last 10 years as the lost decade for commodities, uh, sort of like, like the first uh, decade of this century for equities. Um, you had, I, I wouldn't call it a bubble, but you had a very extreme bull cycle that coincided with some really rapid industrialization in China, as well as some regulatory changes in China that allowed commodities to be used as collateral for lending. And so you really had some excessive demand that spiked prices in the short term. Uh, and of course, you know, the higher it falls, the, har the higher it flies, the harder it falls. Commodities are very cyclical. Uh, what we research we put out a few years ago shows that every seven years, on average, so call it six and a half to seven and a half years, you tend to get 
um, a bottom and a broad recovering commodities. And then about six and a half, seven and a half years later, you tend to get some sort of price correction. This one was very extreme, the most recent one, and it, it was painful. Now, I'm not a permable on commodities. They are cyclical, but what you do tend to see is the, the two to three years following the bottom uh, have very consistently provided solid returns. And so since the bottom of January last year, uh, this cycle has been fairly consistent with previous cycles. The volatility is high, but generally the, uh, the trend has been significantly um, upwards. So we are very positive on the outlook for the broad commodity space over the next 12 months. Uh, but once we get into late 2018, then we'll be watching very closely for, I guess, uh, signs of cracks in the foundation. Um, but if you are disciplined and you rebalance over time, I, th- I do believe that commodities still serve an important role in portfolio. What are some of the potential specific drivers? Is it a, a weaker dollar? Is it growing economic demand? Is it the potential for inflation? If you were to get a little more granular, what, what could drive commodities as we look out sure. uh, over the next couple of years? Well, you do see a very high correlation re- be- between t- – uh, one-year returns in the U.S. dollar and the corresponding one-year returns in commodities. And when the dollar is down more than 6% over 12 months, commodities tend to have a multiplied uh, move higher. And vice versa, if the dollar is up more than 6% over 12 months, then it tends to be very negative for commodities. Uh, The dollar right now is only down about 4% on a 12-month basis, but as we move into November, that very strong dollar we saw after last year's election it's going to push that 12-month return down to the negative 8 to 9% range if we stay anywhere near where we are now. So our expectation is that we're going to see commodities surge over the next six months, again, assuming the dollar doesn't rally strongly uh, over the next six weeks. Um, and and so, so, just again, that's just looking at the historical data uh, and the correlation since the financial crisis. We have about two minutes left here, and I wanted to to briefly circle back around to ETFs. We always talk on this program about how ETFs have democratized investing. Uh, They're providing access to asset classes that I I don't think investors could have dreamed of accessing 10 or 15 years ago. And certainly commodities is one of those areas. There's been talk about the ETFization of commodities, with the thought being that if everyone can access commodities now, perhaps their value uh, maybe somewhat minimized. Do you think there's anything to that? Well, uh, you know, what's interesting is that is that um, ETF commodity AUM is still well, well, well below the highs of 2011. Uh, so from a capacity standpoint, um, I would say that, that, that there's, there's a long way to go. And if, also if you look at sort of the participation rate, um, if anything, fewer people are owning commodity uh, commodity exposure now than they were 10 years ago, again, just because of the rough ride they've had over the last 10 years. And that recency bias, as we tend to call it, the most recent memories and the most painful memories tend to be the strongest memories. We're usually trying to pull clients so out of that uh, paradigm and get them to take a balanced look over the long term uh, before they make investment decisions. So, no, I, I think that actually – um, right now, there's probably a more balanced opportunity in the commodity market than we saw in prior time frames over the last 20 years. Well, Jason, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, boy, just tremendous perspective on commodities and commodity ETFs. We certainly appreciate you joining us on the uh, program today. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. That was Jason Bloom, global market strategist at PowerShares. And I want to mention, Jason has a blog at Invesco.com where he writes on the commodity space. So I would certainly recommend checking that out. And, of course, if you would like to learn more about the PowerShares commodity ETFs, you can do so by visiting PowerShares.com. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll have our weekly market update. This is the ETF Store Show. Welcome back to the ETF Score Show, Nate and Connor in studio. Let's go right to our weekly market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF Store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. Another positive week for stocks last week. The S&P 500 was up nearly a quarter of a percent. And both the Dow Jones Industrial Average and NASDAQ gained about a half of a percent for the week. 
Now, there are several stories we continue to follow in our market updates, uh, which, by the way, Connor, I'm so glad the Fed no longer dominates these updates the way they used to. Uh, But one of the stories we continue to follow is obviously Bitcoin. The price of Bitcoin surged last week to nearly $6,000. It's up over 20% just since we were on the air last week. And I thought there was a really good lesson recently surrounding uh, this topic. So about a month ago, you may recall J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon called Bitcoin a fraud. And he said he would fire any J.P. Morgan employee who traded Bitcoin for being stupid. Well, as it turns out, last Thursday during the J.P. Morgan quarterly earnings conference call, the CFO of J.P. Morgan, Marianne Lake, she said J.P. Morgan is now, surprise, surprise, very open-minded to exploring opportunities in the digital currency space. Uh, So, Connor, I have to wonder uh, if she's now going to be fired. Uh, But Jamie Dimon then said on the call he wasn't going to talk about Bitcoin anymore. Yet on Friday, he couldn't help himself. And he again said people who buy Bitcoin are stupid and it's a great product if you're a criminal. And then he said this was now the last time he was going to talk about Bitcoin. Look, I think it's pretty clear Jamie Dimon has painted himself into a corner uh, on Bitcoin. And I think the lesson here is be careful dismissing things you don't understand. Jamie Dimon is no doubt an extremely intelligent person. There's a reason why he is where he is. But if you don't understand something, just don't comment on it. And look, we've tried our best to educate ourselves on Bitcoin and hopefully everyone listening to this show as well. But we're certainly not claiming to be anywhere uh, near experts on this topic, right? This stuff is extremely complicated. But the one thing we do feel confident saying is this is highly compelling technology. And we think there's a high likelihood this technology will meaningfully shape our future. That's not investment advice. We're certainly not saying run out and buy Bitcoin. But, Connor, we truly believe it's important to understand what's occurring here. It's why we continue to cover this topic on the show. And the more we've educated ourselves on the underlying blockchain technology and having a decentralized protocol where as long as the Internet is running, this protocol works, and we start thinking about all the use cases for cryptocurrencies, you can't just dismiss it. We we think that's negligent. You know, and when you look at some of the names that have recently come out against bitcoin uh jamie diamond's not alone you know we're talking people like a who's who of investing warren buffett and ray dalio you know ceo and founder bridgewater the largest hedge fund in the world have also recently come out and voiced their opinions uh rather negatively around uh, bitcoin and basically the range is either at worst bitcoin is a fraud to at best it's a speculative bubble and You know, I don't think that's fair to say at this point because it's so early in the game. Now, look, betting against guys like Buffett, Dalio, Jamie Dimon, historically has been a pretty bad idea. But at the same time, they're not infallible. And while we're not predicting that Bitcoin takes over the world, we do think the underlying technology, the blockchain technology, is is here to stay. And you're right, Nate, it's negligent to dismiss it at this early stage in the game because nobody has any idea what's going to happen from here. Yeah, and I would say we're also not ruling out that Bitcoin could take over the, the world. I think we're so early in what's occurring here. Uh, but I think the key is you do want to educate yourself on, on what's occurring. You know, Fortune uh, actually had a great piece on this topic last week where they interviewed Bart Stevens. Uh, he is co-founder of Blockchain Capital. And it was funny, Bart took a few shots at Jamie Dimon. I guess while Jamie Dimon was calling Bitcoin a fraud, Bart was actually at the J.P. Morgan San Francisco offices participating on a cryptocurrency panel. The same day. Literally on the same day. And Bart pointed out the hypocrisy, uh, obviously, that was here. But Bart had a quote that really resonated with me. He said, quote, every new technology that is confusing fast moving and disruptive is going to be controversial. And I think there's no question that fits for Bitcoin. But I think why this quote resonated with me is we've seen this movie before. I actually think there are some really interesting parallels between cryptocurrencies and ETFs and bear with me. ETFs have been called the new technology. ETFs can be confusing if you don't understand how they work. And there's no question ETFs have been highly disruptive. 
But think about all of the negative headlines uh, that have come out on ETFs, right, that they cause bubbles and their weapons of mass destruction and they cause stocks to move in, in lockstep. The, the list goes on and on. I got to tell you, that seems pretty similar to some of the headlines we keep seeing on Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And to me, the way to look at this is ETFs have disintermediated the status quo. Financial institutions are losing big fees they used to charge you as an investor. And that's why you've seen big fund companies take shots at ETFs. And I think we may be seeing the, seeing the exact same thing here with Bitcoin. That, you know, I think that's why someone like Jamie Dimon uh, perhaps feels threatened. There's no doubt he feels threatened, Nate, because at their heart, banks are intermediaries, right? For me to send money to you or anybody else, whether it's ACH or a wire or sending money via a check yeah, that you guess have to who cash. Gets to be. Guess who is the trusted third party? Banks. The the foundation behind Bitcoin is the removal of any central authority. And those central authorities, because they're the choke points, generate a hell of a lot of fees playing that role as trusted third party. And Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as a as a whole are a threat to that. I, I thought about this the other day, and I'm, and I'm not claiming that this is what's going to happen, but you have to wonder if, if Jamie Dimon and, and leaders at other banks don't really start taking cryptocurrency seriously. You know, that is, is JP Morgan the future blockbuster to, to Bitcoin's Netflix, right? Because Blockbuster did, had a chance to to buy Netflix, I think, for $50 million at one point back in the day because they thought nobody wants streaming movies, nobody wants DVDs to be delivered to their house. They want to come to the store and shop through it. And look how how laughable that idea is now, right? Looking back with, with 2024 site. And I think you need to be really careful if you are one of these banks that are used to charging extremely high fees as one of the few trusted third parties. Um, to help the transfer of money around the world. And we're not even talking about, you know, getting away from currencies like the dollar and the euro and what, if you want to call them fiat currencies. And that is a whole different discussion. But just the removal of third parties in between the transaction of money is also a core tenet of Bitcoin and why it has garnered so much attention worldwide so far. But I just think it's funny because, you know, relating this back to ETFs, if you go back several years, you can find plenty of large asset managers who are taking pot shots oh, at, sure. at ETFs. And you have to look at the critics, right? And, and Exactly. Their Who's stance. the messenger? Yes. And interestingly, J.P. Morgan was late to the ETF party. Now, they've since launched ETFs, and, and they're starting to get their business uh, cranking on the ETF side. But, you know, they certainly weren't an early adopter. So I, I just think it's a really uh, interesting parallel there. Now, on the note of ETFs and, and fee pressure on fund companies, we have a few minutes left here, and we don't normally delve into individual company earnings reports on this show. But last week, BlackRock released their quarterly earnings, and there were a couple of noteworthy takeaways I, I did want to share. Uh, first, BlackRock ended the quarter with nearly $6 trillion in assets, of which about $1.3 trillion uh, was U.S.-listed ETFs. And by the way, Vanguard was also in the news last week after it was reported they now have $4.7 trillion in assets, of which about $800 billion is in U.S.-listed ETFs. But as it relates to BlackRock, they beat on earnings per share, but their sales and earnings growth was slower than their asset growth. And I found a really interesting piece on Bloomberg where the question was posed, is BlackRock the Amazon.com of investing? And kind of the point here was Amazon obviously continues to grow at a ridiculous rate, but their earnings have been somewhat disappointing uh, given that growth. And is that what we're now seeing with BlackRock, where ETFs are experiencing this unbelievable growth, but because it's such a competitive space and fees have come down so much, it's just not as profitable for the firm I just thought that was a really interesting uh, analogy. Yeah, it it is one, and I think it fits. But, you know, to be clear, BlackRock and Amazon are both doing just fine. I mean, they're literally printing no money question. each quarter. Yeah. But it's an interesting consideration. I mean, think about the comparisons and similarities between Amazon and the ETF business overall. Easy access, convenient, low cost, transparent, cut out the middleman, I mean, et cetera. But the reality is they're tough businesses to be in. 
with razor thin margins. And at the end of the day, when you look at both these companies, the end consumer wins, right? When you look at what Amazon has done, they have done more for the average consumer in the U.S. certainly than any retailer in history. And I think the same can be said about ETFs, but I, in particular, I think it's fair to single out Vanguard and iShares as the two dominant players in the ETF world and, and truly leading this low-cost you know, revolution for investors. But I can also firmly believe that and, and state that these two firms, Vanguard and iShares, have done more for the average investor than any firm in our country's history. Yeah, I mean, they both have disintermediated the status quo. I used that term earlier, and certainly Amazon has done that in retail. I mean, they've com just laid waste to, to the entire retail space, and we're seeing the same thing on the ETF side. You know, this conversation is actually a perfect setup for next week because we'll be joined by Martin Small, head of US iShare. So we'll have uh, an excellent opportunity to hear his perspective on this topic of uh, fee compressions. And iShares is just dominating uh, ETF inflows this year. I saw where 10 of the top 20 ETFs in terms of inflows uh, were iShares, including the top ETF, the iShares Core S&P 500 ETF. And they have uh, six of the top 10 uh, overall as well. But you know, this this fee compression, the story of, of ETF fees continuing to come down, this isn't going away. Think about the news that we just saw yesterday that Spider, State Street Spiders came mm -hmm. out, and uh, they now have a what they're calling a, a portfolio uh, lineup of ETFs where they undercut just about every ETF in the particular category and lowered fees across the board. And they now partner with TD Ameritrade to where those ETFs are going to be offered commission-free uh, on the TD Ameritrade platform. But uh, it's just remarkable because these ETF providers keep one one up in each other. And State Street, I think, no question, was behind the curve right. in, in this, this, this fee war, if you will. Uh, but it, it'll be interesting to see how the incumbents respond. Yeah, you know, this is sim very similar to when iShares launched their core lineup of ETFs, right? Just very, very similar. Plain vanilla, uh, core asset classes at, at rock bottom prices. And they are... You know, I think it's fair to say catching up a bit when you're talking about State Street compared to Schwab, Vanguard, and iShares. Um, so I think it's very interesting that they are entering that game, and, and it is a, uh, what if Eric Balkun has called it, um, the terror dome of lower fees, I think, yesterday when this launched, because, you know, we're just, it's, a, it's an eventuality that I think we're going to get to zero. We're yep. going to get to a zero-cost ETF here at some point, because at this point, we're talking two, three, four, five basis points for the least expensive ETFs out there. And this news did just kind of come out yesterday. Big shakeup at TDA um, that I think we're going to have to spend another show on, really digging into the details of all the news that happened yesterday in the ETF world. But at the end of the day, consumers win because it is money that is not going to the firms that are investing their funds. It is staying in their pocket. But if you are one of these fund companies, it, it is just a, a jungle out there. I, I said yesterday that these, these fund companies are ripping each other's faces off. I mean, it is just a brutal business. But you, the investor, win. That's right. And you mentioned Eric Bal Balkunas. He had a tweet as well saying, you know, Schwab is going to respond in three, two, one. Right. Right. Waiting on that uh, press release. Look, I'm not in the prediction business, but I did say at the beginning of the year in a Street.com article that uh, ETF fee would come out at zero uh, this year. So I still have a couple months left, and i got to tell you, it's looking pretty good. Podcasts of the ETF Store Show are available at ETFstore.com, Apple iTunes, and Google Play. Connect with us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store Show. Again, be sure to join us next week for a conversation with Martin Small, head of USI Shares. Until then, have a great week, everyone.